Annenberg School for Journalism and Communications. I am Camille Gierwitz, Associate Provost of Student and Faculty Initiatives in the Social Sciences, and I am here with Dr. Sean Harper from USC's Race and Equity Center. And we're here to just talk a little bit about uh, Martin Luther King's legacy and whether or not we've truly achieved what it is that he hoped for us. And uh, I can think of no better person to have this conversation with. Likewise, happy day after <laughs> Martin Luther King Day, day for you. Uh, I hope you had a great one. I did, I did. And it was kind of interesting to look at how, you know, across the nation people have decided to celebrate. The celebrations seem to fall into two categories, yeah. sort of service, or sort of cultural celebrations. And I, I wonder what your thoughts were about that, if that is truly reflecting what Dr. King was about. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, certainly we all know Dr. King for his extraordinary social justice leadership, and he for sure was a servant. Um, so I love all of those uh, service things and the day of service mm -hmm. um, commitments that people make. Um, and of course, I also love a good cultural celebration. Yes. Um, we watched the parade yesterday. There was a parade here in Los Angeles honoring Dr. King's legacy. And, you know, it was really great to see so many diverse people mm -hmm. there. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a good King Day for me. I am hoping um, some of the service work sort of shifts in the direction more of the political activism side. So there's, yeah. there's so many ways to talk about service. And I think... Um, you know, the easy entry point is um, working on a community garden or volunteering at a school. And, and to the extent that people make pledges on that day to do that kind of work or do that kind of work, I think it's fantastic. Um, I'm waiting to see some of more of the political organizing side that I think was so central to his mission and to his work. And, and, um, and I think it's a challenge to think about how to make that um, concrete and real for people um, on, on a single day. Yeah, you know, okay, so here comes the critique, right? You and I, um, at a different juncture in this conversation, we'll talk about moderates. But I do think that this is a way for people who have convinced themselves that they they are now the drum majors for justice, that, you know, going and picking up trash on the street on King Day, you know, makes them feel really good about themselves. Mm -hmm. It makes them feel like they are in some way contributing to the sustaining and advancement of King's legacy. But what you are very smartly pointing out is that Dr. King was far more radical right. than that, right? And was about, you know, disrupting systems of oppression, about, you know, using one's platform to, uh, to raise public consciousness about human suffering and about injustice in all its forms. So you're right. Um, I would like to see more of that. You know, I do want to, um, you know, give a very serious nod to the Women's March that happened here over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't on King Day, but it was on King Day weekend. And um, I was down there in downtown Los Angeles and saw lots of women and men and uh, gender queer people with, you know, with, with, with signs in, in protest of, you know, the just the terrible things that are happening in our in our nation and world right now. I think, uh, when I think about King's legacy, I think one thing he'd be particularly proud of is the extent to which um, this particular political moment has uh, really awakened people to the significance of rallies, of marches, of coming together in public space to declare their affiliations and their values. I, I don't know what the, uh, what the actual response to that is. I think we imagined a period yeah. where government was more responsive to those kinds of you know, shows of, of values, but um, it is really wonderful to see people, people who I, you know, didn't expect to do that in the past, um, joining in these kind of rallies and these um, public demonstrations. It feels to me, though, Camille, like that is sort of, it, it ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. um, I was incredibly inspired by the rallies and stuff a couple years ago, like, say, two years ago. It feels like, and, and I think you, you're speaking to this, right? It feels like that's kind of fizzling a little bit. Um, I think that there is a sense in the nation that, you know, people's activism is not being heard right. Um, right. and that the uh, very serious petitions of our government are, you know, like not being acted upon. Um, so I wonder if one consequence in the near future is going to be people staying home, right? right? You know, depending on what happens in this 2020 election, severe apathy could very well ensue right. for lots of Americans. Sure. It is, it is a, real, um, a real danger. And I think, uh, you know, Dr. King recognized the power of 
when people come together for a common purpose and have to stand up to institutions. But I don't, um, I wonder what do you think about like the rise of social media and the ways in which people come together in these virtual spaces and um, you know some of these public shaming moments that have happened in social media right around right the right. issues that he's talking about about sharing um, space and in, in environments where you're buying things or interacting with other people and some of the some of the shows of uh, discrimination that we've seen um, I think there are all these ways in which we can think about organizing or activism or presence um, and and some people are very critical of the social media side of it, but it all has a role to play. And I think um, harnessing his uh, vision about activism is something we all need to think seriously about, about what that's going to look like in 2020 and beyond. Yeah. You know, honestly, Camille, I want wherever the activism occurs, whether it is in the digital environment or on the streets um, in communities across our country, I want the activism to become far more radical. I feel like we are living in radical times mm -hmm. and in, in times <laughs> where, you know, like frankly, it is time out for um, a, a, a more moderate um, approach mm -hmm. to social justice, right? Um, you know, when, I, when I'm at these rallies and when I watch them on television, there is a thing about them that disturbs me a bit. I've never seen so many happy people uh, at these yeah. rallies. You know, <laughs> they're like there and they're 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 so happy and I'm like, "Wait, now are you here um as a gesture of just simply showing up or are you really upset and angry and you've had enough and you want to gather with others here to, you know, like strategize about ways to like actually bring about the kinds of social and economic change and racial justice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, does that strike you as weird, the happy protesters? So now you're appealing to my side as a First Amendment professor. So I have all sorts of views right, about protests and about government making space for protests, but also around um, what brings people out time and time again. Right. And I think part of the civil, civil rights movement definitely is these sort of serious moments and, and, and dogs and water cannons and violence. And, um, but there are also ways in which people created these intimate spaces of support and um, affirmation that kept them going. So I don't, I, the answer is I don't know the answer to the question. I think that something happens when you don't have a responsive government, when you're out protesting and you don't feel like anyone's listening, but you are um, connecting with others and sort of thinking more broadly about what you might do. Sometimes they do make us really happy though. And, and I wonder if government takes uh, protest less seriously when the participants um, are in that mindset or you know, that may just be what's required to keep things going. So one yeah. of the funniest, not funniest, one of the more interesting ones I saw was a, um, a dance-in. So, uh, you know, taking over an entire neighborhood and playing the music and disrupting the space, this quiet sort of suburban space huh. with these dance parties. And they, a lot of um, genderqueer folks involved and really a very celebratory atmosphere. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Right? Yes. Um, and, and that's yeah. interesting. Um, there's also the die-ins, right, have more serious tone with people sort of demonstrating right. the effects of police brutality in this really physical way. So I think... Um, this is also social media again. If we see mm -hmm. a broader range of types of protests and, and we're all sort of making sense of what that means in light of, of King's legacy and what, what he would um, think about some of these things too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to be sure, when I say that it's time for radical activism, I am definitely not calling for violence. Right. Um, Please don't. You know, I, I'm channeling my, my <laughs> inner Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King all, Jr. Yeah. that I am you know, very much um, about anti-violence. Sure, sure. But I, I do want people um, who claim privately to be so upset. I do want there to be more public displays of their disappointment, frustration, you know, whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, you know, I, w without that, right, I think that, we are going to stay in a place where we're not seeing, you know, serious movement mm -hmm. on issues that are, you know, we owe it to this nation, right, to take firm public stances on things that undermine our democracy. Mm -hmm. When we do that privately or, you know, just merely like happily by showing up for a march, 
um, I, I, I think it's a disservice to the democracy. It's, it's almost like, in some ways, um, the way military service works now. So there's like a subsection of the population that engages in this activity that's important to white American democracy. So there's right. a certain segment of society that serves. There's a certain segment of society that protests. And then there's a large blob of people who sort of go about their daily lives and may have views about those two things, views about our foreign policy, views about the things that we're engaged in political activism over, but they don't have skin in the game. And so they can sort of privately express support for causes, yeah. but we need the public, um, the public demonstration of it as well. I, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I do want to say there are some things that are happening that I think, um, without question, uh, Dr. King would be happy about. And, and, and one is the centering of issues of income inequality in the current presidential campaign. Yeah, for I sure. Mean, right. So the, for the first time, I think that's really on the table, front and center. Um, what are the consequences of the increasing gap? between working class and wealthy and um, the erosion of the ladders or the steps to make your way up right into that yeah. higher income bracket. Um, I think you would be really pleased to see that. Uh, I'm wondering your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, so I'm an undecided voter okay. at this time for the first time in my adult life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like engendering tremendous dissonance for me because I'm normally like incredibly decisive. I will at least say that the messaging around income inequality feels very sincere and real for some candidates, like two or three of them. <laughs> um, but it feels like a talking point for the others to me. Um, you know, I, I am wondering how these things will ultimately play out in policy. Mm -hmm. um, if one of the Democratic uh, candidates were to emerge as the nominee and ultimately win the election, um, will they in fact keep their promise to the American people around income inequality? You know, there are some fundamental misunderstandings and misreadings of Dr. King. You know, some people understand him to simply be or have been a racial justice person. Um, he was for sure that, mm -hmm. but he also cared so tremendously about income inequality Absolutely. and economic injustice. Absolutely. Um, if people who are running for president and others around the nation, you know, really want to make good on the vision and promise of Dr. King, um, you know, they will take more seriously uh, the project of um, eliminating wealth inequality and income disparities, but without doing it at the expense of discarding racial justice. Mm -hmm. um, is so much more comfortable for so many Americans to right. talk about class than it is about race, sure. right? Um, it has to be both, mm -hmm. right? And it also has to include, um, you know, other identities and circumstances that render people marginalized um, in our nation. King cared about all those things. Right. I, I think that's so true. And um, there's a way in which, um, you know, that we've made some uh, incremental progress uh, on the issue of racial equality. And so I think um, this is from Edward Garnillo Silva, a sociologist. Mm -hmm. He says, right, that when you make some progress in that area, then sometimes the class divisions become even more acute and people focus on income inequality. But it's not like you can take your eye off the ball on the, on the other issue as well, that they both remain really important. Um, I gave a, a talk a couple of weeks ago about Dr. King's legacy, and I, I talked about, you know, the difference in wealth between black families and white families. So white families have 10 times <laughs> the amount of wealth, <laughs> 10 yeah. times the amount of wealth as black families do, about seven times the amount of wealth um, for Latinos. Um, whites have seven times the amount of wealth as Latino families. And so the two issues, income inequality and, uh, and race, are fundamentally tied together. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's becoming more visible for people in some of these, uh, you know, little videos they see uh, in social media about the ways in which African Americans are treated just mm -hmm. for occupying space or right. doing innocent things. Um, you can only imagine, right, how that plays out when you're trying to access a job or rent an apartment. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, the evidence is now right there, uh, plain and simple in front of you. Yeah, and people are documenting that evidence, I think, in some, you know, really praiseworthy ways. There was just a report released about a week ago by the Education Trust. Um, it's written by uh, two USC Russier alums, mm. Tiffany Jones and Andrew Nichols. They both work there at Ed Trust. 
and you know in it they offer these really compelling data that show the educational attainment mm -hmm. across racial and ethnic groups um, as well as um, as well as a uh, household uh, net worth and, and income um, and you know there's this striking graphic in the report that shows that you know black people with college degrees make far less than yeah. white people with high school diplomas right, right. right. Um, I think that you know part of our consciousness raising project beyond King Day right like if we really want to honor the legacy of Dr. King every day has to be a day of service um, right every day has to be a day of raising public consciousness about um, racial inequality income inequality and inequality in all its forms and I think that these kinds of reports and videos and graphics and things mm -hmm. sharing those things via social media um, passing them out to your colleagues in a staff meeting or in, in our case in, in faculty meetings right, right. and inviting a conversation about what can we all do together um, in response to what these data are showing us um, would be a serious way to keep the King legacy alive. You know, I think as, as we're talking about it, I'm realizing that that's the piece that maybe could be added to some of these King celebrations um, beyond service um, is actually being willing to sort of confront our historical past to uh, read something or go to a movie or expose oneself, right? We talked about the, the, um, the recent HBO show, The Watchmen, right? Yeah. As a way yeah. of sort of translating some of these really difficult historical um, issues that sort of explain, right, um, wealth inequality to some degree in the United States based on racial grounds. And so there's lots of different ways that if you decided to, right, on King Day, you could engage with maybe some of the hard historical facts that bear on your contemporary economic reality in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you a story? Yeah, and then I got to ask you something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, you can tell I'm on social media a lot. Uh, there's a story about um, an Uber driver um, yeah. who uh, ferried a passenger home from a sporting event, and she told him her story. She was a single mom. She was in college for criminal justice. Um, she was Uber driving, and she was also a hairdresser, right? And she couldn't finish her college degree because she owed $700, but she kept paying for things for her kids, so she couldn't finish her college degree. So anyway, this, uh, this passenger, um, a fairy godfather, right, called up the university and paid her bill for her and allowed mm. her to return to school. And so this story is everywhere in social media. People are praising this man. And so, uh, you know, I offered the critique, um, did he think about why he was in a position uh, to just call up and pay $700 and transform this woman's life. Yeah. That there are so many Uber drivers that do this, that drive right. around and tell stories of economic pain to more privileged people in the hopes that right. someone will say, wealth inequality is too much to bear today, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take this in my hands. But did he think about whether or not, you know, education in the United States should be free? Or right. whether or not we're paying people a living wage? Or why, why there isn't reasonably priced child care? There are all these structural issues. Right that surround the fairy godfather story. And so that's where I'm hoping people will, will move if they're really serious about King's legacy is there are all these feel good moments where you can do a single thing, but the more challenging work is to think about the way society is structured to give some people less of a chance. Yeah, you know, that is the thing that has me like really hopeful in this moment. I know that like so far, like I've like talked about like all of my like frustrations, but um, I am feeling really hopeful about the Finally, we're talking about structures and systems. Mm -hmm. um, now, some people have been doing that for, for years. Let me not disrespect uh, sure. their labor. But it does feel to me that finally the conversation in the nation is taking a turn um, you know, to give much more attention. And there's much more dialogue around uh, systemic inequality and structures that reproduce disadvantage and immobility. And yes. suffering, and human suffering. Absolutely. Um, when I think about, you know, the shift that maybe we can ask people to make, the sort of everyday person on the street, um, I'm inspired by the story of a, a woman who just just passed away. Her name is Courtney Microton, and she um, was part of a movement to create integrated schools in the Los Angeles area. Mm. But what she did was she created an organization that gives this two school pledge. Uh, to parents, and it says to them, take a look at two uh, majority minority schools in urban districts that you ordinarily would just look past. 
and really assess the quality of the school and consider sending your child there rather than racing off to the suburbs. Right. And she actually right did that uh, herself. Unfortunately, she was like I said, she was killed recently in a, in a car accident. But her organization, the work continues, and um, it was a way in which that commitment to integration, to racial equality, um, is undertaken in a really serious way where you have skin in the game, where you are changing a daily practice that actually affects your family's life. I think if more people were bold in that way, um, society would look a lot different. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, what I really appreciate about this uh, example that you just gave um, is that it, it, it is about not making assumptions about particular yes. places. Mm -hmm. I would say that we should go even a step further. You know, people, you know, read these online reviews of schools mm -hmm. um, and so on. I think it's important to go to schools and make a determination for oneself about the goodness of those schools. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can make a King connection here. Um, there were a lot of people who hated Dr. Martin Luther King, and they didn't know him at all. They hated him mm -hmm. based on what they heard about him. Right. They hated him because he was attempting to disrupt the white supremacy that uh, they were clinging to, right? Um, you know, there are people who hate Crenshaw High School, but they've never been there. They advance a narrative mm -hmm. about it being a hopeless place. I'm spending a lot of time there these days mm. and in schools like it. And, you know, if one wants to be king, like they wouldn't just buy the narrative that is sold about a place or about a community or about a group of people, they would get to know that school, that community, that group of people. You know, people love to throw at me, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. believed that we should judge people <laughs> by the content of their character, right, not right. by the color of their skin. So, sir, why are you race and equity center director, like, trying to divide us by race? I'm like, wait, um, A, I wasn't doing that, and B, I don't need you to remind me of, you know, this one line that you know from uh, one King speech, right? right? But um, getting to know the content of one's character requires engagement with persons, mm -hmm. um, right? right, to understand, and communities to understand the character of those places and right. those people. That That's so, it's such a critical point, and, I, you know, we have to sometimes think about why certain quotes or why certain snippets of a speech um, become, you know, these memes or circulate in this way and become well known in other parts, right, are, right. are sort of lost to history. Oh, um, you mean like this whole like <laughs> um, book of essential readings, uh, a testament Fantastic of hope, the essential book. writings and speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Um, yet one has to go beyond that one liner and really read the about the the, the serious commitment an inspiration that was articulated by Martin Luther King. And the serious critique, you know, like a lot of people think of, um, he, here's another sort of fundamental misunderstanding. They think of Malcolm X as like the radical, like angry one, and Martin Luther King was the nice, like right. peaceful one. There's a lot of anger articulated in the speeches mm -hmm. um, that are in this book, in the, in the writings of King. Right? Um, sure, Martin Luther King Jr. was very much a proponent of anti-violence. Yes. But he still very much had a serious critique of America, of white supremacy, of income inequality, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people don't know that part. And I think even if they focused on that one quote, if we could kind of, you know, explain why um, it's not enough to say you're going to judge, um, you're not going to judge someone by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Because so much of the work that King did was in groups that were formulated, you know, in the black church. Absolutely. Right? In culturally and racially specific communities that articulated a vision. And then, of course, were joined by a larger constituency and became diverse. But there are ways in which a racial perspective gives you a unique outlook on a problem from in a particular community. So not all people from the single racial group think alike. Of course, we know that. Of course. But there's, certain, there's something about racial specificity and that experience in a particular location that can create unique insights. 
and it becomes part of the content of one's character. And so you can um, you can reconcile these things. I Absolutely. mean, he certainly reconciled them in his own life. His point about not judging by the content of your character was right your Crenshaw high school example, which is get beyond the stereotyping and really appreciate the substance of what a community has to offer. Yeah, and go to that place. Mm -hmm. You will see life there and beauty and promise, right? Um, it is quite racist, as a matter of fact, to just presume that a community where a bunch of black people live, that there must be nothing good happening there, right? One can't, in one sentence, quote a Martin Luther King uh, one-liner, and then in the next sentence, say to me that, you know, nothing good is happening in South Central LA or at Crenshaw High School or anywhere else mm -hmm. in Baltimore, Detroit, um, Compton and other places where lots of black people live. And it, it may require a shift in perspective as well, a, a paradigm shift. So another one of the things, um, I'm just about to say on a point in my sister and the work she was doing, yeah. was uh, she continued to evolve and she recognized that a lot of white suburban parents were coming to these schools attempting to recreate what they knew as though uh, the suburban model was the best model. And she recognized that there were actually, again, these unique insights produced by that community that actually articulated a vision for the school that was something that, um, that her family would benefit from. And so I think as people think about engagement and people think about racial progress and what it means to be have a truly diverse and inclusive community that creates the sense of belonging, it's a willingness to um, question the things that you've held on to as representing excellence or quality and um, consider whether there's something more, because all of us yeah. benefit when we expand our perspective in that way. You know, this reminds me uh, quickly, so I love books. Uh, one of them that I'm absolutely in love with is Despite Their Best Intentions, and it's a, it's a book by Amanda Lewis and my friend John Diamond, uh, who's a professor at University of Wisconsin, and it is about the racial violence that black students experience in suburban mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. uh, which is a thing that is often not talked about. Um, you know, I am working on a new project right now with one of my PhD advisees, and um, we're writing about racial violence in schools across the country, not so just important. in suburban schools, but you know, really, sure. um, you know, a across context. That would have been a thing that Dr. King would have been very disappointed mm -hmm. about and inspired to do something about, right? The the, the persistence and, you know, honestly, the recent uptick in racial violence in schools, I know for sure it would be a thing that he would be organizing, you know, many of us in communities across the country to do something about. And I mean, you know, school is the first place where you are really learning lessons about um, what it means to be a member of a community and a citizen in this way where you don't have a lot of choice about who you're exposed to. and, and you have your first experiences with rules that you believe were fundamentally unfair. It's this right. place that does so much in terms of cultivating people's capacity for um, being responsible citizen later on. So to have that moment also injected with the threat of racial violence is just such a, a, a tragedy, um, but a formative experience for so many of us. When I was bused to, um, I was part of a busing initiative that sent me to a, a working class white mm -hmm. school district. And uh, I, my greatest fear about high school was there were race riots at mm. the high school that I would have been bused to. Yeah. So I ended up testing into a specialized high school and I avoided it. But it's part of so many people's you know, stories right. um, and, and it shouldn't be. And that's something, again, if you're looking for a place to get involved or issues to think about, um, you know, there, there are so many of them out there. I wonder, Camille, in the last minute that we have remaining here, if we might um, inspire the nation um, you know, one last time um, I wonder if for King Day 2021, if folks might think of it as, um, so please continue the day of service, continue the cultural celebrations, but I wonder if there was a third space where people used it as a day of strategizing mm -hmm. for the remainder of the year and thinking about how we could bring people together, set an agenda, um, figure out how we're going to advance and actualize that agenda um, from one King Day to the next. Oh, I love that idea. I, I think, think we should do it together let's here do at it. USC. Let's do it. <laughs> here, January 2021, um, we will do our, a, a King sort of teach-in strategy session 
here at USC. That's fantastic. I love the idea. Count me in. Okay. Count All me right. in. Um, so thank you for uh, joining us for this conversation. We've really um, enjoyed sharing this with you. And if you're interested in participating in conversations in the, the near term, additional conversations, uh, please keep in mind USC's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Week, mm -hmm. which will run from March 2nd to March 6th. Um, there'll be about 50 to 75 events covering all aspects of the diversity continuum. Um, please join us and, uh, and get involved. Thank you.